Hi, everyone. Welcome to Another Nerve. Um, just as a brief introduction, we are the Neural Engineering Research Venture, bringing neuroscience to life in Africa and around the world. And Siobhan and I will be your hosts this evening. And then you will find Darby in the comments, as always. Um, we also are very excited to show you guys how NERV's footprint keeps growing. So yeah, we are very proud to see our global engagement expanding still. And we will keep tracking this and keep you guys posted as we go along. Then we have some announcements for you this evening. So first off, um, you guys should check out the Indaba X website for the AI4D innovation grant applications for many projects. They will be open for another week. Um, the deadline is the 6th of July, so be sure to check that out. Then if you are interested in um, having a look at the Indaba Grand Challenge, the, the project is, is centered on finding a cure for leishmaniasis. So you can follow the links in the comments to um, the panel that was held yesterday for that. So be sure to check that out also. Then there's also a virtual data science Africa conference that will be hosted from the 24th to the 31st of July. And the application closing date is the 15th. Then um, also have a look at the AI brains and computational thinking meetup. It is a Cape Town based meetup that is open to everyone to share and explore AI's impact on the world as we further our understanding of how machines learn and how we think. And then lastly, also be sure to have a look at the Worldwide Neuro website. It is an online platform that hosts different neuroscience seminars. So you can find all kinds of different neuroscience seminars on there. Okay, then let me maybe just pause as I go along just to get an indication that everyone can hear me. Just maybe a thumbs up or so in the comments. Um, just to be sure that everything is working. Okay, I'm just assuming that I am live. <laughs> okay, cool, there's a thumbs up. So just a couple of house rules before we continue. So we have a very diverse group of people and um, we ask our audience to please use respectful and inclusive language. Then as always, the ask a question feature is where you guys should post your questions during the, the presentation. So please remember to do so and also to vote for your favorite questions. Because um, once the presentation is done, we will invite you on screen to ask your questions, starting with the most voted for questions first. And if you don't want to come on screen to ask your question, just remember to add, please ask at the end of the question. And then Siobhan and I will be asking that on your behalf. Um, this also applies if you don't have a mic. So don't let that discourage you from asking questions. OK, and then if your connection is slow, just try and refresh your browser. That usually does help. And if all else fails and it's still not working, the talk will be available at the same link to stream after the event. OK, I will now be handing over to Siobhan to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thanks, Julianne. Hi, everyone. Um, I will be introducing our speaker, Dr. Terry Stewart. Um, Dr. Terry Stewart is an Associate Research Officer with the National Research Council of Canada. He is one of the primary developers of Nengo, a software tool for developing brain simulations. His research interests are predominantly in the high level control mechanisms for routing information through the brain. Dr. Stewart also works closely with both digital and analog neuromorphic hardware designers, helping them design energy efficient, massively parallel hardware for neural networks. And with that, I will hand over to our speaker. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen and get all this started. All right, uh, is that working for everybody? That's, the slides are visible? Yep, looks good okay, for my end. Perfect. Um, hello, uh, so I'm Terry. Um, I'm gonna be talking about work that I've been doing. I started at the University of Waterloo um, over the last 10 years, and I'm now continuing um, at the National Research Council of Canada, which is Canada's largest uh, government research lab. Um, and what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about, you know, how do you build large brain models and try to do that to figure out how brains work. Um, 
So that's sort of my goal. Um, I, I self-identify as a cognitive scientist. Um, my underlying goal is I just want to understand how the mind works. I want to know what the algorithms are that are underlying cognition. Um, when I came at this sort of from an engineering direction, that engineering was my was my undergrad degree, um, and I, I really feel that the best or one important way to sort of test theories of how the mind works um, is to actually build a computer simulation of those um, of those ideas. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in building mechanistic models, so cognitive models where the components within the computer simulation are supposed to map on to components in the real brain. Okay. Um, so that's what I have been doing for, I actually started doing that during my PhD. Um, but when I was doing that during my PhD, I followed the sort of path that a lot of people that are doing high level cognitive modeling do, you know, is that, well, if you're interested in the algorithms underlying human cognition, um, then just focus, like a lot of people would just focus on those algorithms um, and not also add the problem of how that's implemented in the brain. Cause it's sort of like, it feels like that's almost two problems. It feels like um, there's one question is what algorithms are running around in the brain. And then another question is, well, how do those algorithms happen to get implemented in neurons? Um, and so a lot of people only focus on, on the algorithm part and don't add in this extra constraint. Um, and that was what I did for most of my PhD until I saw the work that, um, the beginnings of the work that I'm gonna be talking about um, in this lecture. Um, and I think there's two big reasons why you really wanna pay attention to the brain, even if all your, what you're interested in is level cognition. So one reason is, look, a, a brain-based model, like if you have a theory about how the mind, how people, I don't know, remember sequences of numbers, if you want to, you know, you have a theory about how human memory works. Um, if you have a brain-based version, if you have also an aspect of that theory that says, okay, here's how neurons do that, um, then you're going to have new predictions. You're not just going to be able to predict sort of, well, how quickly do people forget? You'll also be able to predict things like, oh, what sort of pattern of activity should I see in different parts of the brain? Um, or what would happen if I... Um, if people are trying to remember digits when they're on different drugs, um, how long should these sorts of things take? So um, basically, you, if, if you're able to tie your theory to biology, then you get more predictions. And that's sort of one really good reason. Um, it's not actually the reason that most got my attention and really got me in this direction. Um, for me, it was this. It was that if I'm interested in how the mind works, and what algorithms are going on in the mind, and I then then I, it would really help to know what neurons are good at, um, what sort of algorithms neurons are good at doing. Um, so, for instance, if I know that I'm going to be taking a theory and implementing it in a computer model anyway, um, if I don't constrain myself to think about what biology can do, then I might, when I'm coming up with that algorithm, when I'm coming up with those theories, I might just be biased towards ideas that are easy to implement in normal computers. And there's no real reason to believe that normal computers are good at the same sorts of things that brains are good at, that, that neurons are good at. Um, and so what I'm really hoping, or the, 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 the hope of the sort of work that I'm gonna be describing today is that it says, hey, look, here's a very specific description of what neurons are good at doing. And then I can use that specific description or rethink all of our ideas about um, uh, algorithms and the sorts of computations, um, the, the sorts of theories that you should propose about how brains work. Um, so, so that's sort of the goal. Um, and then what, what's gonna lead into is we're gonna develop a piece of software called Nengo, and that I'll, I'll talk briefly about, that then lets you implement those sorts of algorithms. Um, and then in turn, that's gonna turn out to be a really useful programming tool for hardware that is more neuron-like more neuron -like than traditional computer hardware. So there's a lot of this neuromorphic engineering hardware, this uh, brain-inspired um, computer chips um, that are trying to turn out to be really easy to program using these sorts of techniques. Um, so even though it sort of starts from a cognitive science trying to understand the brain approach, I think we also end up with an interesting engineering application at the end. Okay, 
Um, so that's sort of the overview of where I'm going. Um, what basically happened is I ran across the initial work by Chris Eliasmith, um, and this is the initial book that sort of lays out the theory that I'm going to be presenting here. It's called the Neural Engineering Framework. So this seems like a very appropriate forum to be talking about it in. Um, and uh, the core theory in, that's laid out in this book is what I'm about to talk about. Um, it's not a particularly readable book. I will warn people if people are, are sort of looking for an introduction to it. Um, it's a very math heavy um, book, um, which is great because it gives that underlying theoretical foundation. Um, but that can also make things a little bit inaccessible. So just as a little bit of a warning for people wanting to dive into those sorts of details, I think some of the later the, the later book that I'll mention later um, uh, makes it things a little bit more accessible. But this is where it all started. Um, and the core ideas are to just sort of let's take a step back and um, what try to try to describe exactly what neurons are good at. And so what I've got here, I've got this little diagram at the bottom that is sort of the a very traditional neural network, um, sort of this this group in the middle. So so hopefully, if people are used to neural networks, they're used to the idea of you have some sort of input. You have some sort of hidden layer of neurons, um, and then you have some sort of output. And you have connection weights uh, between in each of these areas. Um, this particular network that I'm drawing here is a little bit different in that we're only putting neurons in this middle layer. Um, and the input and the output is just um, nothing. So, so you, you, you don't actually have a nonlinearity here. It's just the raw input is coming in here. So the raw input comes in here. It's multiplied by some connection weight matrix fed into a layer of neurons, multiplied by another, the outputs of those neurons are multiplied by another connection weight matrix, and then you get an output. Okay. So that's, but it's still the sort of traditional neural network. Yes, you can use these sorts of neural networks to approximate any function that you want. Um, as long as you have enough neurons, you can go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, and so one way of phrasing this sort of idea is, I've got a group of neurons here in the middle, um, I've got some input vector x, so this x, this input could be multiple, um, could be a vector of, I don't know, three numbers, four numbers, five numbers, however many it is. The neural activity in the middle here is forming some sort of distributed representation of that input. Um, and then from that distributed representations of, the, of that input, we're decoding out some value that's related to the input. So y is some function of x. Okay. This is a little bit different way of phrasing the traditional neural network, but hopefully that's like consistent with how most like the general ideas of a neural network. Um, I'm gonna just to depict that sort of in a little bit more of an animated way, just to be sort of really clear what we're talking about here. So here's an example of doing this with four neurons. All right, so I've got this input that is changing over time. Um, and in this particular case, I'm using a little bit more of a biologically motivated neuron than maybe traditional neural networks are using. So I'm using the what's called the leaky integrate and fire neuron. So, um, so over here in the middle, um, each of these rows is a different neuron. Um, and what these neurons are doing is they're taking their input that's causing voltage to build up inside the neuron. Eventually, the voltage hits some threshold that causes the neuron to fire. The, that's the spiking activity that we're seeing in this in this second diagram. So the little vertical lines that are happening there. Let's run that again. So these are the spikes that are coming out of the four neurons. Spikes in biology, when when even though that's sort of okay, the neuron is firing. What neuron? What a neuron firing means is a neuron is uh, releasing neurotransmitter to the next neuron, and that's the neurotransmitter that is actually causing the um, input to change into the next one. So this is sort of a depiction of that voltage or that, that neurotransmitter amount. So this is the input to the next neuron. So these are um, the four outputs from these neurons. And then what I'm doing here is I'm just simply saying, all right, that's the middle of that diagram I was showing. But now what we need to do is we need to do another weighted sum. So we're taking these outputs, we're doing another weighted sum, and we're adding it together. And we're getting our actual output, which is this top, this other black line. And in this particular case, I've optimized this network to try to make 
to the output be the same as the input. Okay? So this is where so it's trying to compute an identity function. Okay. Um, and you can sort of see that with four neurons, it does kind of an OK job. So my, my input is this black smooth line, and my output is this black jagged line. Um, and but I'm just trying to, so it's, it shouldn't be surprising um, because this is a sort of a fairly traditional neural network. It's a little bit weird that I'm doing it in with spiking neurons. It's, it's not a thing that people are normally doing, um, but the basic conceptual idea should be the same as what people have done with traditional feed forward neural networks. Um, and of course it gets better with more neurons. So here's the, exactly that same thing with 50 neurons. Um, and one fun thing you can do with this sort of framework is you can also make sure that by adjusting your inputs, you can make sure that the neurons in the middle are matching some sort of biological, you know, like what sorts of tuning curves do you actually see in the brain? So you can go ahead and make this middle thing um, map onto um, map onto biology fairly nicely um, if you have particular biological data, um, but that doesn't really change this overall structure. Hi, Terry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I just received a comment asking if you can maybe click the hide button on the bar at the bottom of your screen that says stop sharing your screen. Oh, so just the hide. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. So Thank much. you so much. Sorry about that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, yes, right. It was right over top of a bunch of things. All right. Uh, thank you. So, um, so so far, so it's like just very traditional neural network sort of things. I mean, this is, as I said, this is just a simple um, input, hidden layer, output, traditional neural network. And what I'm and what I'm trying to say is, I, is that we can use that to approximate some function. And that's also a fairly traditional idea that neural networks are function approximators. So if I hand that idea to an engineer and I say, all right, I want to build up a larger system with that, then the engineer can say, okay, well, fine. If I have a component that can compute an arbitrary function and I want to you know, build up a bigger model out of a bunch of these things, well, that's pretty easy. I just do two of them, right? I just, here's my input. I do some group of neurons, I get an output, and then I take that output and I feed it into another group of neurons and I do another output, right? So this is now computing two functions. And then I could build up bigger and bigger models out of something like that. Um, and so you could use this as sort of a programming framework. Um, but then when I go back and talk to the biologists, the biologists are going to be like, oh, hold, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. That does not map onto biology. Sure, like maybe this sort of group of neurons, um, yeah, okay, that, that can map onto biology. But there is nothing in biology like this, oh, here's some input, here's a middle layer of, of here's, here's something in the middle from a, like, no, this, this Y thing here, this does not exist. The closest thing that really could exist is fine. I might have a group of neurons A and a group of neurons B, and then there might be a big set of connection weights between them. But there certainly is not um, a group of neurons, connection weights down to something, and then connection weights out to something else. That just that just doesn't happen. So, so if I want to map this onto biology, how do I get rid of this middle thing? And the nice thing is, um, well, hold on a second. This D thing here, this is just a set of connection weights. This green box in the middle, it's not actually doing anything. There's no nonlinearity there. And then we've got another set of, of weights here. Well, I could just multiply those together. All right, so again, what's happening here, even though when I designed the system, I said, okay, I want Y to be some function of X and Z to be some function of Y. That Y thing that was in the middle there, I can just totally get rid of it once I've created my model. Multiply the two connection weights together, and I get a connection weight matrix between my two sets of neurons that will do exactly the same thing as this. So there's no approximation involved here. Those, those two networks are exactly identical. So the point of this is this is a really weird way of generating a connection weights between groups of of neurons. So I sort of, I design things this way, so that y is some function of x and z is some function of y. I find all my connection weights using whatever techniques you want for making a small little neural network. Um, and then once you have those connection weights, you can combine them together 
and you get the connection weights that actually would map onto biology. So that's the core weird trick that's going to let us go ahead and build large systems um, um, out of these sorts of components. Okay. There's one slight little interesting complication that shows up, and that is, well, there's something that's going to be happening over time there. Because as I said, when a spike happens, when a neuron spikes, that releases neurotransmitter, and that gets reabsorbed over time. Um, and you traditionally have these sorts of curves from the neuroscience literature that look like this thing up here. This is sometimes called the postsynaptic current. Whenever a spike happens, it releases neurotransmitter, and then that's gradually reabsorbed. Um, and, um, and so that's going to be happening in this connection here. Um, and it turns out that you can then still express what's happening um, if one's used to this sort of convolution notation. So this is something that's, um, again, we grab from the engineering literature um, and sort of say, OK, well, yeah, you've, you've made this network to try to approximate this function, the function f. But what you're going to end up with is kind of that same function, but convolved with this filter. Um, which in practical terms ends up meaning something like, well, it's a smoothed version of that function. So if like if there's a sudden change in X, Z does not change immediately. Z takes a little bit of time to change. Um, and this low level neuro this low level neurotransmitter um, time, the amount of time that this is happening, that's what really controls how quickly Z is able to change. Right. Um, so conceptually, I can just think of it as some sort of smoothing that's going on there. But if I want to write it in math terms, it turns out to have a nice form that I can write that out in. The last, OK, this is sort of the last little bit of mathematical framework that I'm going to give to sort of um, lay out the foundations of this. Um, in real brain, so what I've just described is real, it seems to fit really well for feed forward networks, for networks where there's just input going to output, you know, one layer of neurons talking to the next layer of neurons talking to the next layer of neurons. That's pretty rare in the actual brain. Um, in the real brain, we tend to have a lot of recurrent connections. So we tend to have, um, there's some sort of input X coming in, that goes out to Y. So this is my group of neurons in the middle here. And then there's some sort of recurrent connection. Um, and that recurrent connection is going to have exactly the, sa the same sort of, if I, if, I, if I phrase it in the sort of way that I'm describing here, then we can generate those recurrent connections also by choosing some function that those neurons um, should, uh, that, that connection should approximate, um, and then use exactly the technique I just showed in order to find these, those connection weights. Um, but then what the heck is this system going to do? Right? And this is where the math ends up being useful. Because if I then write out the math of what such a system would do, um, and then ask someone to solve it, because I don't want to solve that equation. Uh, if you, you take that equation, you hand it over to the nearest you know, mathematician, um, they'll immediately say, well, OK, look, if you want to work with anything that has a convolution in it, then uh, get rid of the convolution by doing one option is a Laplace transform. Laplace transform turns out to be really nice because it turns out that this shape, this postsynaptic current, has a really nice Laplace transform. So you just look that up in the back of your textbook. The textbook says what that transformation is. And now you just do some algebra. And then you convert it back into the time domain. And so that's just sort of says, all right, this is what that system will do. If I, if I have my input connection approximating this function, f of x, and I have my recurrent connection approximating this function, g of y, um, then that means that this overall system will have y will change according to this equation. And that's kind of cool, because what that means is that if I have a particular differential equation that I would like my neurons to approximate, then all I have to do is set my feed forward connection to this and my, and my recurrent connection to that. OK, that's a bunch of weird math. What the heck is the point? The point is people are used to thinking about neural networks as function approximators. This is saying that if you have a recurrent neural network that has something like a synapse in it, that has something like this postsynaptic current in it, then you can also use that recurrent connection to approximate differential equations. So this is adding, an, uh, this is 
making the claim that yes, neurons are great as function approximators, recurrent neural networks are great at approximating differential equations. And this method I've just showed says that if you have any differential equation you want, um, I can build you a, um, a biologically realistic connection weight matrix that will approximate that differential equation. That's the core trick that is gonna let us do sort of engineering and build up large systems. Um, because if you want to do something like memory, if you wanna have something like um, uh, motor control tasks or any a lot of sort of things that you want in a cognitive system, you can write as a differential equation. Um, and we're not particularly used to doing that, um, but, uh, um, but this is the, the claim from the approach that I'm just saying here is this is exactly what neurons are good at. So groups, groups of neurons can store vectors, connections from one group of neurons to another can compute functions, synapses sort of filter that function, um, and recurrent connections compute differential equations. Um, and with enough neurons, you can always ap approximate a function to whatever degree that you have accuracy that you want. Um, but uh, base, what's generally gonna happen is if you have sort of a reasonable number of neurons, um, then extremely disjoint functions or functions that are really hard, really not smooth are gonna be really hard to approximate. Um, so you're generally gonna wanna stick with smooth functions. So this is exactly the sort of thing I was looking for at the beginning is I wanted to know what's the set of algorithms um, that neurons are good at implementing because then I can go ahead and take existing cognitive theories and try to put them in this form um, and see what happens. All right. And so that's exactly what the sort of task is that I normally do. I sort of take algorithms, cognitive theories, try to write it in this sort of form you know, where there's variables and functions on variables and functions and everything like that. And then I've got these, you know, given the framework that I said there, I can just convert that into groups, actual groups of neurons. And I, at each of these groups of neurons, I can go ahead and impose whatever biological constraints that I want. Okay. Um, so that's why I want to sort of call this programming with neurons, because you're sort of, you're specifying this high level algorithm. Um, and then you've got this automated tool that will go ahead and compile that algorithm down to um, whatever biological details that you want. Okay, um, so that's what neurons are good at. Um, that's where I sort of have spent lots of my time sort of taking algorithms and converting them over. Um, one of the big challenges that ended up happening in that is, okay, fine. The algorithms I've shown there, okay, I can maybe see, you can do sort of you know, motor control algorithms, you could do like simple tracking of objects, you could do really simple tasks. But if I wanna use this as a theory about human cognition, does that really work? Because come on, language processing, symbolic logic, things like that, those sorts of algorithms don't look anything like the functions I just described, right? They're not smooth functions. Um, they're not easy to approximate. How in the world can we do anything like symbol manipulation using these smooth functions? Okay. Um, and in order to really make, you know, call this a cognitive theory, I think we have to, you know, have an answer to that question. Um, and one of the interesting things that ended up happening here is by trying to answer this question, we ended up with sort of a symbolic logic theory that gives you, lets you do new things. So what do, what do I mean by that? Um, so the, the core idea of if you want to do something like language using vectors, um, that's, that's not a totally unfamiliar idea. People have proposed that before. They've proposed ideas like, okay, if you have a bunch of different concepts, blue, red, circle, square, whatever, um, just imagine you have a vector for each of those concepts. So there's a set of numbers that means blue, a set of numbers that means red, a set of numbers that means circle. Um, and if I want to say represent a blue circle, then fine, I can just add those numbers together, right? And I'll get a new vector that means blue circle. Um, but then that runs into the problem of, well, how do you represent something like red circle and blue square? Because you can't just take the vector for red and the vector for circle and the vector for blue and the vector for square and add them all together and then take, okay, I've got this resulting vector um, uh, because that would, because you want red circle and blue square to be a different vector than red square and blue circle, right? Those are different concepts. Okay. So in, in cognitive science, this is traditionally known as the binding problem. Um, how do I how do I represent something like that using neurons? Um, 
And fortunately, people have proposed answers to those, and we can just use other people's answers. Um, and so there's a group of people um, that sometimes it's called vector symbolic architectures. There's a good overview paper here um, that just says, hey, look, there's more to math than just addition. So there's other operations you can say. And so, hey, this would be a bunch of math that would represent red circle and blue triangle. If you go and do this math, so each of these individual components is a vector. You go do this math, you end up with another vector, and that vector is going to be the one that will mean red circle and blue square. Or sorry, red circle and blue triangle. Um, there's a bunch of different options. There's there's one by suggestion by Tony Plate to use the ma mathematical operation of circular convolution, and we chose that one simply because that's exactly one of the things that neurons turn out to be really good at approximating. So it, it's a nice smooth function. Um, I can go ahead and approximate that function really nicely using the techniques that I just showed. So that's what sort of drew our attention to that approach. Um, and that is the sort of thing that we've done. Um, so if you use that approach to go represent neurons um, and you use everything that I've described there, that was what let us go ahead and build up um, this video here that I was showing at the beginning and I'm showing again now, um, which is uh, the world's largest functional brain model. So what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, it's two and a half million spiking neurons. Um, it, the, the, the neurons are organized in something like um, uh, 20 different brain areas that map onto brain, real biological brain areas. Um, and it's able to do tasks. This particular task it's doing is uh, we're showing it a sequence of numbers visually. It has to remember those sequence of numbers. And then when I show it a question mark, it has to write out that sequence of numbers. And so in order to build this, we just took, we had to take everything right from the vision part of, all right, we're just getting pixels coming into the eye here. It needs to recognize what those digits are. That's a fairly traditional neural network. Um, it needs to build up an internal representation of that sequence of digits. That's exactly using that dynamic system stuff that I was just showing. Um, and it needs to, um, uh, and then it needs to go ahead and, and do motor control once it sees a question mark. Um, and that's just taking standard motor control stuff, which is already in the form of differential equations um, and going ahead and implementing it. Um, it was an interesting programming task to say, how do you go ahead and build that using the components I just described? Because you don't have things like if statements or for loops or things like that. Um, but it turned out to be possible. Um, as all of the different steps, you can approximate with various different functions. So that was that was great. You will also notice those were who were sort of paying attention there when it was writing out that sequence of digits, um, it missed the eight, um, and that's actually a traditional pattern that you'll see in humans. They'll tend to forget things in the middle of the list, um, and so it's kind of nice that the kind of mistakes that the system made ended up mapping onto the same sorts of mistakes that people make because it's never a perfect approximation of these functions. And so the neurons are always approximating the functions that I've asked it to do, and given a reasonable number of neurons, they're not doing it perfectly. So that was kind of exciting. The more exciting thing is this same network could do multiple tasks. Um, and this particular task is one that tra has traditionally been really hard for cognitive modelers to come up with an algorithm for. But once we were forced into this domain of you have to represent symbols using vectors, it turned out to be really easy. Um, so this task is, I'm showing it a pattern of numbers. I'm, I'm also drawing that pattern in the bottom left so that, um, so that just the, we can see it. Um, the, the model doesn't have eye control, so it can't look at, you know, it can't move its eyes around. So I have to sequentially present things to it. Um, but the idea is fill in the blank, what comes next? And most of us found that pretty easy to do. So the answer was five, five, five. And the question is, what algorithm could possibly do that? How do I write an algorithm where I give it an arb a new pattern like that and it figures out what comes next? Uh, people have tried to do that using normal computer, um, uh, you know, normal cognitive modeling for, for, for ages. Um, there's been a couple attempts, um, but uh, it's hard to come up with an algorithm. Um, as to how do you know what comes next, given, you know, that would work across an arbitrary set of patterns. Of course, you could come up with an algorithm that happens to work for this particular pattern, but one that would work across many patterns is hard to come up with. 
Um, but it turns out that once you're forced into this weird, okay, I have to represent symbols using math uh, or, or using vectors, um, it turns out to be not too bad to do that. Um, I'll give a, just a brief idea of it right here. Um, so the question is, so, so for instance, we're getting the sequence of things um, and we're trying to build up some sort of representation of each of these items. So for instance, to take a look at this item here, a one followed by a one followed by a one. Using the method that I was just talking about, you could represent that as a vector, so that would be S3 here, by doing this math. So I have a vector that means one, I have a vector that means position one, um, I have a vector that means position two, and I have a vector that means position three. And if I do that math there, then I could claim that that's the sort of representation that uh, is the representation of one, one, one. Right. Um, it's just, all right, there's lots of different ways I could represent the sequence. This is one particular way, sure, why not? Um, and if you do that to all of these, then now what you've got is you've got vectors that represent sequences of numbers. So I've got eight vectors, each of them represents a sequence of numbers, and the task is what comes next. Right. And then it turns out that once these things are vectors, well, now there's other things you can do with them. So now you could, for instance, you could do something like, okay, well, what vector could I bind with this list to get the next list? Right. And that's just math. Right. So I can just do that in terms of math. This tick mark is the inverse operator. Um, and so what and what you now get with is you now you have a vector that represents the transformation between two symbol structures. All right, and you have a bunch of those transformations. All right, so it's just kind of weird that okay, once once you've got a vector, a way to use a vector to represent symbols, you also now have a way to use a vector to represent the difference between structured symbols. And then once you have those vectors, if you really want to, you can go ahead and once, okay, here's all the transformations, then you can do the average across these transformations. And now you could take that average, you could apply it to the last one and you get, now this should be an approximate sign, you get approximately the, the correct answer. That's a really weird way of solving this problem. That's a very strange algorithm that I would not have come up with if I was not forced to uh, think about only the sorts of operations that neurons are good at, because every single one of these operations is things that I know how to implement in neurons. So that's what, what I mean by this, this approach forces me to think about very different types of algorithms or to think about cognitive, um, think, think about minds in a very different way. Okay. Um, that's the sort of the theoretical background. Um, we've developed software that um, lets you go ahead and do all this stuff. Um, it's freely available online. You can go ahead and download it. There's tutorials and things like that. It's what we use for all of these things. Um, I'm going to briefly, though, mention there is an interesting um, issue here, um, which is speed. Um, and this is what's going to get us into the interesting hardware aspects. Um, those videos that I just showed of the whole simulation, when we ran those, one second of those simulations took two and a half hours, uh, what was a high-end computer back then. Um, that's two and a, that was only two and a half million neurons. The full brain is way, way bigger than that. If I really want to do theories of the full brain, I'm going to need better. I'm going to need some way to speed that up. Um, and we did speed that up just by simply taking those theories and or taking that same software and making sure the software will run your models on GPUs instead of CPUs. All right. So, so one nice thing about the Nengo software is once you've defined your model and it works fine on your computer, okay, fine. Now we just push a button and we go, okay, let's come run it on your GPU. Um, and that sped things up a lot. Um, so currently, if you want to run that model on a high-end GPU, it's something like 10 seconds to, to produce one second of simulation. Um, but that's still, there's still more room that we can go. Um, and in fact, it's not just the speed problem, it's also a big power problem. Um, so if we took G modern GPUs and went ahead and tried to simulate the whole brain with them using the techniques I was just describing, that ends up saying that it's going to take something like two gigawatts of power. So that's a couple of nuclear power plants. Um, and but the actual brain uses 20 watts to do that. And so this really seems like there should be something we should be able to do about this. Um, and this is where we start getting into this idea of neuromorphic hardware. People are making um, uh, computer chips that are specifically designed for doing neural networks. Um, 
And the fun and one challenge has always been that when they make this different hardware, different hardware has different neuron models because they're sort of optimizing for one particular neuron model. Um, but the nice thing is all the techniques that I just described, they don't care what neuron model you're using. Right? They're just, okay, whatever neuron model you want, fine, we'll go use that and use those to approximate the functions. Um, so this means that we can just use the techniques I just described to take any neural network and just compile it or take any algorithm and compile it to different neural networks depending on the different hardware. Um, when we do that, so on the left there, there's some energy comparisons um, between a GPU that's on the right there, that's the giant blue bar. Um, the CPU is on these sorts of tasks much more energy efficient. Um, so this is just looking at energy efficiency. Um, and then on the left is three different types of neuromorphic hardware. Um, one of them, so the Movidius and Jetson, those are sort of really low power GPUs is what they're meant to be. And then Luihi is a new is a new chip from Intel that is specifically about spiking neural networks. And you're seeing something like a hundred times reduction in power on exactly the same um, system. Um, so that's so with digital, we can see something like a hundred times power reduction for some tasks. It's going to be different for different tasks. Um, and then on the right there, we also are seeing here's um, a, this is a chip that I helped um, design with the group at Stanford called uh, Braindrop, um, and that's an analog chip where there's you actually have transistors on the chip that are being the individual neurons, and we designed it in such a way that it fit within the NEF sort of the the Nango, the, the th neural engineering framework stuff that I was just describing. Um, and power numbers we got out of that are something like 100 times power reduction from Luihi. So you know, we get 100 times going from the GPU down to this Intel chip Luihi. Um, and then it looks like going to analog would be another 100 times power reduction. Um, one caveat in there, this was a test chip. And this like we only had a really, really tiny chip. And it's really hard to design these things. Um, so I think these th these are are far away from being um, useful, um, be available in production, um, but uh, at least showing that these this sort of technique makes these sorts of things programmable is great. Um, and especially since as you make these analog chips, as you get away from the ones and zeros of traditional digital computing, um, you start having this thing called transistor mismatch, which means that. Um, the actual chip that you design, each chip is slightly different just because of the manufacturing process, but that just ends up mapping into, well, each neuron is slightly different. And that's already true with the neural engineering framework stuff anyway. Um, so it's fine. So, um, so we end up being able to make use of that, um, which was kind of exciting because a lot of people who work in these analog chip things are really, really focused on trying to get every single chip exactly the same, but this is pointing out you don't have to. All right, um, so that's the whole like a whirlwind overview of the stuff that I play with. Um, yes, algorithms can be converted into neurons. So if you have particular theories about how the brain works or some particular cognitive system that you're interested in, if you can put it into the frame, into the this vectors and functions on vectors and differential equations, um, then we can automatically compile that into a neuron model. And that's really cool. That helps all sorts of cognitive theory investigation. Um, and it also gives an interesting way of programming neuromorphic hardware, which can be very energy efficient. Um, and uh, I think there's all sorts of industry, possible industry applications of that. Um, if you need AI type algorithms or, or even just any sorts of algorithms to be run in very low power. Um, for more information, uh, there's these two books. Um, this first book is the one that I don't recommend. The second book um, is one that I think is a lot more accessible and sort of summarizes a lot of what I've just said here. Um, there's some websites for the software. There's a forum for um, discussing, you know, people can talk about the software. Um, I also have a longer series of lectures that you can get at through this um, that actually goes through some more of the details of what I just talked about. Um, and we run a two week summer school um, well, we don't run it this year, of course, for obvious reasons, but usually we run a two week summer school um, where people get together and learn about this stuff and then use it to work on projects. Um, and of course, there's my email at the end. Um, thank you so much. Um, please, I hope, are there any questions? Great. Thank you so much, Terry. This was very cool. Um,
Okay, so we do have some questions. <laughs> and let me just see what is the top one at the moment. Okay, so the first question is from Dan. <laughs> And he wants to know, what advantage do these hand-designed spiking models have over gradient descent trained rate networks? Example, in terms of scientific insights, methodology, et cetera. Yep, really good question. So um, to me, the biggest thing that we're doing here is the, the traditional gradient descent type problems. You sort of, you specify your input and you specify your output. And then you say, I have no idea what's going on in the middle there go do gradient descent optimization and find out what goes on in the middle. So one thing that we're doing here is we're saying you can specify things going on in the middle there. So if you have um, reason to believe that particular parts of the brain are doing particular things, um, or if you go and look at the task that you're doing and say, oh, hold on a second, in order to compute this task, I'm gonna need these intermediate steps. Right? Then you can go and specify those intermediate steps um, and go build up your network um, much more quickly. So um, so one is sort of this practical sort of gradient descent has limits in really complex situations. And so by adding in this extra structure, you're helping it along. Um, and then the um, and then another big aspect in there is that um, once you build the networks using what I've talked about, you can go ahead and apply gradient descent on top of that if you really want to. Right? And so you can also think of everything I just described as just, um, a really interesting way of specifying your initial network. Instead of starting with a random network, um, you can um, initialize things this way, given your theory about what's going on. Um, and that can often give um, big improvements. Um, often we find that when we do that, we only get a, like a couple percentage improvement over the hand design network um, um, for a task that you can hand design. Yeah, so I like using both of those techniques is I think really the summary there. Um, uh, if you know things about the internal structures of the algorithm, um, go for it. This lets you use that information. Um, and if you don't, then just use gradient descent. Um, and sometimes you can even have that happen in different parts of the network. So sometimes like with, with Spawn, with the big model, we use gradient descent for the vision part of the network. Um, but then everything else, um, we um, use this hand design approach. Okay, thank you. And thanks for your question, Dan. Um, then we have Dean on screen to ask his question. Welcome, Dean. Let me just, sorry, quickly unmute you here. There we go. Thanks. Um, I might be missing the purpose with this question, but in terms of mapping onto biology, I was wondering if I were to go and build a classical spiking model, like a Bruno and Wang's model with a, um, in alternative decision-making model. Mm -hmm. And I were then to take the smoothed firing rates as the target function for a neural engineering framework model and we're to mm -hmm. try and fit this model to that. Could I expect the parameters to align, like the weights to align to the original model or? Uh, Quite possibly. We haven't done much in that direction. So certainly that approach of taking an existing network model and then using the things I'm showing to approximate the same nonlinearities. Um, we have used that uh, for the the basal ganglia part of our of our model, and that's a, and that worked really nicely. Um, so I don't think we we, we haven't. Um, I don't think I can say that it'll always align perfectly, <laughs> um, but um, but I think that approach is really promising. And one nifty thing that you get out of it that was really important when we did it for the basal ganglia is that when you do that solving with the NEF we often found that you could put in more biological constraints. So for instance, we could put in the right neurotransmitter time constants um, and the right sorts of tuning curves. Um, and that helped, that ended up leading to getting the right timing effects out of the model. How long does the system take to um, settle on a particular answer? How long does the system, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, how long does it take for different parts of the brain to stop spiking or start sparking. Um, so I really like that we got timing effects um, much more easily out of that. Thanks. But I think I think more should be done in that direction. So great question. Um, and now we have, yeah, here we have Tali. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Um, I had a couple questions. So I wonder which question I'm supposed to ask. <laughs> 
Um, so the first one voted here is the um, which particular VSA models have proved most robust? Uh, nice. Um, so the just to answer so VSA, that's the vector symbolic architecture. So that's this idea of taking words, converting them into vectors, and then combining them together. Um, the one that we've focused on most is uh, Tony Plate's uh, holographic reduced representations. Um, and that's because that all of the operations in it were things that we knew neurons were good at. Um, we've also had a lot of discussions uh, with Ross Gaylor and his multiply accumulate permute um, structure. Um, and it's it's got some neat, uh, or sorry, multiply add permute, uh, whatever. Um, it's got some nice differences that you can do things like um, uh, play with transitivity, and so there's, there's some there's some extra nice um, structures you can do on there. It's not quite as simple to implement in neurons, um, but that's the other one we would play with. Um, we haven't done much with the ones that are m based on binary representations, so some of them are just assuming ones and zeros, and that's because I would argue that neurons are not good at representing ones and zeros. Neurons are good at representing continuous values, um, which is a little bit of a contentious statement. <laughs> Hmm. Maybe I can maybe I can combine that with the, a more detailed question that I asked later, which is when I was getting interested in vector symbolic um, architectures or whatever you want to call them, um, it was yeah it was motivated a binding problem like what how do you solve the binding problem? But even if you can solve the binding problem, you've got to do something much more ambitious ultimately, which is to well we think which is to to represent kind of complex meaning thoughts, chains of reasoning. And if you yep. think about the, what what those things are, they're, they're kind of graphs, right? They're mm -hmm. not just sets of tuples. Um, you, you might even think of hypergraphs because relations can have more than two atoms in them. Definitely. Um, how on earth do we go about embedding those in, yeah. in vector spaces? Yeah, I will. I will point you in a couple of papers because this is exactly the challenge. So we've done things like let's embed all of WordNet um, in these sorts of approaches, and so um, and 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 in particular, making sure that you can sequentially step through these things. So um, to me, what it ends up turning into is you can you can embed these big giant graphs. Um, you can embed a lot of information in a vector, um, but and then in order to get it out it looks like you end up needing two components. One thing is you need a really good control structure. You need some way of saying, okay, now I need to do this step, now I need to do this step, now I need to do this step, now I need to do this step. Um, and uh, and so that's what we use our basal ganglia model for. Um, that turns out to be really, really good for that. Um, and then, but the other thing we ended up really needing in order to do large graphs of, this, of the sorts of things you're talking about is we also needed sort of a little bit of an associative memory. Um, and sometimes, uh, or sometimes, I, yeah, even uh, a cleanup memory or a header associative memory. Um, having a good model of those ended up being really important. So, so that that's a system where you 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 feed in something that looks kind of like the vector for red, and you get out the exact vector for red. Yeah. Um, and by it was by just chaining those two components, it turned out that we could do a lot of these complex manipulations. So I did things like. Uh, implement uh, the Tower of Hanoi task, where you've got to do some planning and going step through a bunch of, of things. Um, and I'll, then also doing things like representing um, WordNet, which is a, here's a big set of words in the relationship between words. And then you can do things like, you could ask it, all right, is a uh, mouse a mammal? And it would need to go reason through the sequence of okay, a mouse is an animal, is a, it's in, and go go reason through this the sequence. Um, and uh, as we at least showed that. So I've got a couple papers on that that I can. I assume I can post some links to that at some point. <laughs> Please. Excellent. Thanks. So I have more questions, but I want to give other people <laughs> a chance too. So maybe um, I'll. Come back we don't have that many more questions on here, so you're welcome to ask a couple more. And we do have time left, so go for it while we have you here. Great. So I saw a, re a really interesting um, presentation by Tim Behrens of of his what he calls the Tolman Eichenbaum machine, mm -hmm. and it's an attempt to try to exp 
it's kind of has a bunch of different roles, I guess, motivations, but it's an attempt to, among other things, explain how we see grid like um, and place like cell behavior, but for abstract concepts, right? Mm -hmm. And so his model has this has this kind of nice property that it generates effectively maps, but of mm -hmm of conceptual spaces where you're navigating in some very yep. potentially very very abstract space. Um, and it, it all comes out quite naturally. It's not really baked in. It just sort of does that um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a straightforward self-prediction sort of task. Sure. Um, have, have you, have you, do you have thoughts on that? Do you see it connecting sure. to what you're doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I haven't looked in detail at that particular one, but certainly the tying this to grid cells and play cells, and in particular grid cells and play cells in this higher conceptual space. So, um, so that that it's so again for people who aren't familiar with this, there's this idea of grid cells. Um, there's really clearly neurons in the brain where, as someone's running around in an environment. Um, these neurons start firing, but they don't just fire for one particular place, that's a place cell, but you'll also find these grid neurons that they will fire not only for this point in space, but also this point and this point and this point and this point and this point in some hexagonal grid. Right? And it's kind of weird, Nobel Prize, you know, people have been playing with this for a while. And it's been often proposed that this is that, that you can generalize that to not just physical space, but also conceptual space. So, you know, um, height and you know how far you are through a task or any any sort of continuous thing um, people have proposed that there's something like that going on in, in the brain as well um, we've been playing with that lately that circular convolution operation turns out to do that <laughs> um, so if what you have to do is you need to generalize the circular convolution to um, uh, instead of just so if you have a particular vector, and you bind it with itself, all right? So that's sort of, you can think of that as sort of raising the vector to an exponent, right? Um, and and that's that's sort of how we how had we built up discrete representations before, position one, position two, position three. Um, you take one vector, bind it to itself, you know, have a vector for position one, you bind it for itself, you get a vector for position two, you bind it for itself, you get a vector for position three. Um, it turns out there's a continuous version of that. So that you can just you can bind it with itself 0.7 times, or bind it with itself 12.3 times, and that gives you continuous space. Um, and if you use that as a way to represent continuous space, um, you get things that look a heck of a lot like grid cells. Um, and you get this, and you can use it not just for position, but you can do all sorts of other things. Um, again, I have some papers on that. That's that's worked just over the last year or so. Um, so we have a couple conference papers on that. We've been calling them spatial semantic pointers. Um, and uh, I will point some links at that. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I was shocked at how nicely that maps on um, using an operation that we'd chosen not for like, like that we've just been chosen for mathematical reasons. Um, but yeah, um, so that, that's some really neat research right now. <laughs> that's nuts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'll go with another one. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually involved in a summer school at the moment. I'm tutoring at the summer school at Wolfram Runs. And we found it's, it's, diff it's different. I've been to the, the um, physical ones before in previous years. It's definitely different, but it's in some ways it's much more convenient for everyone because you can kind of go about your ordinary life while you do that. Um, obviously, it takes up a lot of time, but but it's, I mean, it's environmentally friendly. It's it doesn't impose as much of a financial burden on people from resource-starved countries. Have you considered maybe doing a digital version of your summer school? We we yeah. So we definitely want to figure out something more in that direction. So our first step was to get the lectures recorded and posted online. Um, to me, the the big thing that we find with the summer school uh, that we run here is that sort of, OK, spending 12 hours a day in close contact um, working on projects together, because we tend to organize it such that there's sort of, for every two students, there's one you know, person from the lab who already knows Nango and who can sort of directly supervise and, di and directly help. Um, so mostly it's a question of this year, we didn't really feel that we would be up for being able to do that sort of close connection remotely. 
Um, I mean, it's mostly it's that blocking off that two weeks of time. Um, so, but I would love to figure out some way of doing that online and having um, projects happen online. So my hope is we get the videos posted. Um, we start some initial discussions if there are particular models that people are interested in. For um, instance, over the last year, so someone that I met at a conference, hey, what really wanted to do a model of the Stroop task? And so we just met online a few times and put together a model of the Stroop task. Um, so um, that sort of thing has been tricky, um, but I think doable. And I would I would be really interested in doing that more, um, especially since I mean. Last year, I think I flew across the ocean four times, and that's just silly. That that just made no sense at all. I'm really quite happy. Like, I, I would prefer to not do that sort of travel. Well, I would prefer to not, not have that sort of environmental impact. I'll put it that way. Um, the in-person meeting, I would really like to learn better how to get the same advantages of an in-person meeting, but through a remote meeting. So that's one of the reasons I was really happy to, to see this. <laughs> So, um, yes, I would love to do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to write a blog post about how I think such schools should be run, just from the experiences that I've had. And I'll maybe send that through to you if you're interested. Perfect. Cool. Um, I think maybe let's quickly get Siobhan to ask. We have two questions from um, some of our other attendees. So I think let's get Siobhan to ask them. And then, Tali, I'm going to keep you here. Then we can come back to you after. Cool. Uh, no, nope. I can't hear you. Let me quickly, I'm going to try and, and mute you and unmute you. Let's just see if that works. Probably it won't. <laughs> OK, I'm re-inviting you quickly. It's Let's see if this works. Yay, technology. Technology. <laughs> it's so much better now than it was like a, a two years ago. Like I can't it's imagine very, very trying true. to do this. <laughs> um, Tali, you can maybe in the meantime, if you maybe want to ask one of your other questions so long, so we keep it going. Oh, sure. Um, Thanks. I, I, I guess one of the things, I mean, if, if I read your papers, it'll probably answer the question, but it might be interesting just for people who don't want to put in that, that effort um, to hear that your answer now. Um, how does control flow work? So if you have a discrete operation, like let's say you're doing that cleanup operation or pattern completion, yeah. that's like a discrete step. You either do that or you don't do that. Mm -hmm. How does how do soft fuzzy neurons decide in mass to do something like that or not? Good question. Um, so really to me, this becomes the question of when you're taking your algorithms and converting them into this sort of functions and differential equations sort of form, you really have a problem anytime you have an operation that's sort of, okay, currently my value is X, and now what I want to do is, if X is above 0.5, then set it to one, and otherwise set it to zero, or some sort of like discrete operation like that, and just sort of happens over one at one point in time. And the problem is that you can't instantly change what a group of neurons is representing. Um, like. If, even if I start driving it towards one, it's going to take a while to get there. And this is going to go through all those intermediate values in the meantime. Um, the, so like I think one ex strong example of that is, um, so one of the simple tasks we were trying to implement when we were working with these symbolic logic sorts of things is just counting or, or even just going through a sequence of letters. So you're thinking of the letter A, then think about the letter B. And then if you think about B, think about the letter C. So just nice sequential task, easy to implement in normal um, symbolic terms. How do we do that with neurons? And the problem is that if you've got the vector for representation for A in a group of neurons, and then you start driving it towards the vector representation for B, it's going to go through a bunch of intermediate representations. And it, it, it's going to take some time to do that. Um, and while it's transitioning, from A to B, the system that it looked was looking at the A and says, oh, hey, look, this is an A, I should push myself towards B, is now seeing a bunch of intermediate states. And all of a sudden, it starts seeing a little bit of a B. And so now it starts, even before you've made it to B, it starts pushing you towards C. <laughs> and it's just, ah, this is a big mess. Um, and it's something you just didn't have to worry about with traditional algorithms. Um, Again, this actually turned out to be something where one one step that really helped there was the basal ganglia model, because the basal ganglia, which we were using as a model of, 
here's a bunch of different tasks I might want to do. Um, which one is most relevant at this point in time? So I've got 20 different mental operations I might want to do right now. I, I treat those as, um, and I, I've got some sort of calculation happening that says, you know, am I in the situation where I should be doing action one? Am I in, in a situation where I should be doing action two? Am I, you know, that, that's just uh, fine. That's just a bunch of function approximation. So that's just a bunch of, here I've got some internal state. I'm extracting out some function that says, is it good to do action one? Is it good to do action two? Is it good to action three? Feed that into the basal ganglia, and really all the basal ganglia is doing is which of those things is the best right now? So you can think of it as just computing uh, the function, uh, which is the maximum. And interestingly, when you set the basal ganglia up using biologically realistic um, parameters, it takes about 15 milliseconds for it to make that decision. And it's got a little bit of history, so it's got a little bit of sticking to sort of picking it. Once it's picked something, it'll stick with it. And that starts giving you this little bit of, of a sort of, well, once I've made the decision to go from A to B, all right, I'm going to stick with that even though I'm transitioning on to C. Okay. So that's that was one neat thing that just sort of fell out nicely. Um, that didn't solve it all the time. So th a lot of times we also found transitions that needed to happen a lot, um, uh, that we needed to be a little bit more more careful on. And for those, we've started adding in um, accumulators. So um, uh, there's a lot of things in, in Cognitive Models where, so the, the, the traditional place there is you're staring at a screen, you've got a bunch of dots moving left and right, and you've got to push a button whether they're predominantly moving left or predominantly moving right. All right. Um, so that's the sort of task, and people have traditionally modeled this as an accumulation of evidence task, where you start building up, you, you've got some sort of evidence of, all right, they're kind of like, some of them are moving left, some of them are moving right, but eventually you sort of, you reach this threshold of, oh, okay, I'm pretty sure they're predominantly moving right. And that takes some time to build up. Um, that you can implement, you can directly take the normal theories that are phrased in terms of an integrator. And so you can take that, call that a differential equation, approximate it using the methods that we're showing, and you get this sort of thing that, that at least takes a little bit of a time before reaching a threshold of a decision. Um, and if you just drop those into the model, that's turned out to be pretty good for both matching human data on how long it takes to make that decision, but then on more practical grounds, making these sorts of something closer to a discrete step. Um, so, so that's sort of, that was a little bit of a technical thing, but that that's, I think, part of the challenge of taking algorithms, you know, we're used to thinking about algorithms in terms of if statements and for loops and, you know, tap steps that just instantly change a number from one value to another. And I think that's misleading. I think that's something that is, I mean, it's great for computer science algorithms. I'm relatively convinced that just those sorts of algorithms can't be what brains are doing. And so I really want to use, um, I really want to push people to consider algorithms that don't have steps like that. Um, and I'm really curious whether that'll start giving very different insights into human cognition, um, as opposed to the, the much more computer science-y type things that people have been doing um, traditionally. I have a follow-up question to that, but maybe we can go to another question. Okay, let's see if Siobhan's mic is working. <laughs> no. Uh -oh. Okay, maybe let me quickly ask those questions and then sure. I'll, I'll jump back to you again. Um, okay, so we have our first question here from Stephen, who he first of all says, happy Canada Day to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and then he is asking, what type of problems do you think this type of algorithm slash technique can solve better than traditional algorithms? Oh, fun. Um, huh. So I think I want to do two different answers to that. So one answer for the people who are interested in cognitive science, who are people interested in trying to understand human cognition. Um, I think I think having um, when we've taken traditional models algorithms and then modified them to fit this approach, we've gotten things that um, map onto human behavior better. So have have 
better, um, you know, have error rates that match onto human behavior or, um, or have right sort of reaction times. So if your goal is to match human behavior, um, uh, then, um, then I think I, I would just say that across the board for like any sort of psychology tasks, I would, I would really want to use this sort of thing. Um, but that's not always people's goals. So, so sometimes when people ask that question, the goal is, no, I just want a system that just behaves well, that just like, you know, I can use this for an engineering task, you know, recognize faces, do speech recognition, whatever. Um, and for those sorts of answers, I would say the place where you would get an advantage with these sorts of techniques is if you can map your algorithm, if, if your algorithm doesn't require those sorts of if statements, it doesn't, you know, I wouldn't want to use this for balancing my, my you know, checkbook or balancing my, my, um, my you know, budgets or things like that, you know, adding up a bunch of numbers, no, don't use these approaches. Um, but for things like speech recognition, image recognition, um, and I would also say things like adaptive motor control, um, a lot of those algorithms can be mapped into these neurons. The advantage there, I don't think you would get, I wouldn't want to say that you get a big functional advantage, but I would want to say that you get a big timing or a big energy efficiency advantage. Um, so um, if, and that is if you have access to hardware that is specifically optimized for neural networks, because there's a bit of a catch 22 here thing where, um, if you're running these algorithms on traditional hardware, traditional hardware was designed for if statements and for loops. <laughs> and so uh, it's not designed for these sorts of things. Um, but if you have the hardware that is designed for these sorts of things, then I think you can find huge energy efficiency gains and some functional gains because um, energy efficiency ends up being really important. So like for instance, with autonomous cars, um, a lot of the autonomous car systems that are out there, they have these giant neural networks running in the car. And for a lot of the setups, they're using more power to run the neural network than they are to run the car. Like that's, that's just a lot of processing power and that's limiting how much compute they can do in the autonomous cars. Um, if you want to build those networks bigger, you're going to need to go to some other technology. Um, and um, if you want to, to improve those systems, um, so, so I think, I think the energy efficiency argument ends up being more than just energy efficiency. It just, if you have it entered being energy efficient, then you could scale it much larger. Um, we've started pushing things in that direction. So there was a spinoff company from the lab at Waterloo called Applied Brain Research. Um, and its big focus is, is on trying to say, all right, where can we find industry advantages, um, or situations where this energy efficiency, it sort of lets you do something new. Um, but I try to be really careful to claim that as far as we can tell right now, it's not like you're getting anything, you know, fundamentally better about these sorts of techniques other than this efficiency argument. So it's not, there's not sort of new things you can do. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, then our next question is from Irvi. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. And um, the question asks, could the algorithms for pattern completion in the large scale models be self-amenable? Oh, sorry, can you, what was the end of that question? It's asking, could the algorith algorithms for pattern completion in the large scale models be self-amenable? Uh, self, sorry, I, I, I missed the last word. It's self-amenable. Um, sorry. Can you should be type? able if you if you pop open the question bar at the bottom of your screen. Yeah. Um, where it says ask a question and you you scroll down um, to the fourth question. Oh, sorry, then, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, self modifiable. Sorry, I, I was just okay. missing the word. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it depends on what we mean by. Um, uh, by that modification ability. Um, so on one sense, they are already being self-learning in that they are adapting to the particular situation. They're saying, okay, I've never seen this particular pattern before, but I'm still gonna go ahead and apply that, apply these sorts of steps. But I think 
And so there's a little bit of learning that's already happening there, but I think you're asking a, a deeper question that is, um, can the algorithm itself be learned or modified? Um, and that's something that I hope is true, but we have not really done much in that direction yet. Um, the idea is going to be, um, uh, the approach that we've sort of taken in that is fine. We've got all these individual steps. We know how to implement the individual steps in the algorithms. And now we have this question of, well, if I want to amend the algorithm, if I want to modify the algorithm, I need to sort of modify the sequence of steps. And that sounds an awful lot like a reinforcement learning problem. Um, and so the approach has been to sort of, can we just take the approaches that reinforcement learning people are, have been doing and apply that to that task? Um, biologically, that makes a lot of sense because actually the things that are deciding what step to do next, when we map those onto the biology, that is the connections from cortex into the basal ganglia, which is exactly the things that everyone has for ages said, oh, hey, look, this is where reinforcement learning signals go in the brain. Um, so, um, so that's the hope is that works. It does run into exactly this timing problem that we were just talking about before that you don't have these nice discrete steps, um, that reinforcement learning traditionally uses. Um, and so you end up in this domain where it's a continuous time reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, and so that's a bit of a research question. Um, uh, I think we've, we've shown some initial examples. It's something that we want to do a lot more of. Um, because it is sometimes a little tricky to hand design these algorithms. Um, and so I would love it to be able to just sort of hand design an initial algorithm and then have it self-modify, have it self-learn to sort of improve that algorithm a little bit from that position. Um, we haven't yet got strong results on that, but I would love to do that more. And in fact, I'm just starting a project specifically on this continuous reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. so. so. Okay. Ask me any in, in, in a year, I might have better answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so let me just quickly check, but I think that is all of our questions from our other attendees. So back to you, Tali. <laughs> oh, uh, the bad news is I can't remember what my question was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just see another question just popped up. Um, okay, so. Ezekiel, I'm not sure if, if he wants to come on screen. Oh, he says, please ask. Okay. Um, he wants to know how robust is Spawn to input uncertainty or noise? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, surprisingly robust. <laughs> um, so for instance, those digits that we show, we do often sort of show um, as, we're, as we're giving the inputs, we will give it um, sort of the various different handwritten digits from the the MNIST data set. Um, we'll also um, add on random noise in there. Um, one trick that we generally do to make that robust is when we're doing the optimization to find that initial tiny little neural network, so the, the little neural network that is just sort of input, one layer of neurons output. Um, when we do the training to find the connection weights on that little neural network, um, we make sure that component is robust to a heck of a lot of noise. Um, and um, so, I mean, we basically just, we use least squares minimization and there's a parameter in least squares minimization for how much noise do you want to be robust to? And we just crank that up. Um, and that means that then when we build the giant neural network, um, it tends to be extremely um, robust, both to the little bit of, of random jitter from the spikes, um, but also robust to the, just variations in the input. Um, so it ends up being extremely important to be robust to that. If you if you don't make that happen, then the whole system falls apart. Um, so like the, this whole thing of I'm doing my optimization on a bunch of little sub networks and then stapling them all together to get my big network, um, that really only works if you make sure that it's robust to noise. So great question. I didn't I didn't highlight that aspect. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes. So that brings us to all of our questions, unless Tali, you have maybe remembered yours. Well, I have a, I have a different question. So I guess okay. it, it seems like a lot of things would be opened up by having like two, three orders of magnitude increase in speed of simulation, right? It would just <laughs> let, you, let you do much more. Um, are there idealizations that you could make that say, hmm, we don't care so much about the micro details of how this population is going to do its spiking, 
let's go to a rate model, but let's have lots of tuning to capture certain phenomena that are pe apparently yeah. quite important. Yes. So I love that sort of doing that sort of thing. It's one of the reasons that we made sure Nengo has this sort of adjustable level of neural detail and use whatever sort of level of neurons you want. Because sometimes it's even sort of at different points in your model, you you want different, um, uh, you know, different levels of detail. Um, it turns out that the spiking versus non-spiking doesn't really matter in terms of computation time. It's still like whether I've got 100 spiking neurons or 100 rate neurons, still pretty much the same amount of computation happening. Um, so we tend, um, but that said, you tend to get a lot less noise with the rate neurons. So a lot of times when we're initially building a model, we'll use slightly fewer neurons, but use them as rate mode neurons. Um, mostly just get rid of, to just reduce the amount of noise. Um, but then we switched over to spiking neurons and it's not that much slower. Um, so it tends not to be a big difference. But then if you do something more drastic, if you do something like, okay, I replace 100 spiking neurons with one rate mode neuron, that's not gonna work at all because that drastically reduces the types of computations that you can do with the neurons. Um, you know, I could go from 100 spiking neurons down to like 80 rate neurons. Fine, okay, <laughs> um, but um, but you tend we tend not to see big advantages that way. Um, more often, when we're doing when we're building up these models, we might find a particular component and we're like, wow, this component here, the neurons are doing such a good job of approximating the algorithm that I want that I'm just going to take that part of my model and I'm going to replace it with the actual algorithm. Right? So there's an, again, there's an option in Nengo that says, all right, for this part of the model forget neurons, just compute the algorithm that I'm saying there. Um, and so, but, so if you're happy, if there's particular points in the model where you're like, okay, I'm happy that the neurons are doing exact, are doing something really close to the algorithm, um, then I'll switch those over. But I really like, you know, actually having to prove to myself that yes, okay, the neurons are approximating that extremely well. Um, you can find some good rules of thumb there. So for instance, if the algorithm is a linear algorithm, I will pretty much always just know, okay, yes, I know neurons are gonna approximate the linear algorithm just perfectly, it'll be fine. And so I can ignore that. Um, but for anything more complicated than that, I wanna make sure that I that I run the model with neurons first. Um, and if I am start running running into speed problems, then that's when I start you know, grabbing time on GPUs and them. But even on GPUs, you're still pretty limited because it's still, you know, if I wanna do a model more than about 20 million neurons right now, that's that's really pushing what I can do on GPUs. Um, and that's to me why I sort of want to keep being friends with all these people making fun neuromorphic hardware. Because um, they're making this fun hardware and they have no idea what to run on it. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I know I know what to run. Please let me run this on your model. Um, and, um, but since it's all prototype hardware, it's hard to get it at scale and you have to sort of fight through all this weird sort of, okay, how, what's your weird software interface to your weird hardware? Um, and again, that's one of the reasons why I really like that Nengo is now being sort of maintained by the spin-off company, the supplied brain research company, because then it's their, their job is to make sure that it talks to all the hardware and I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> um, now I just have to worry about getting a hold of the hardware. Hmm. Um, yeah. But it is an interesting I, limitation. That said, with with twenty million neurons, I still think there's tons of research that could be done. Like even if you limit yourself to that size, um, but it does limit what I've been able to do in terms of language type things. So that's so. If I were to go in there and profile things, would I see that matrix math is the predominant kind of computation being done, or, or what? Yeah, so, um, yeah, and this becomes very important when we're sort of figuring out what sort of hardware um, is really needed. Um, it is vector matrix operations is pretty much everything, right? Because you have a vector of here's the activity of your neurons and you're multiplying them by connection weight matrices. Um, we get some cool advantages because of the weird technique that I was showing of how you generate your weight matrix, right? I had. I had a group of neurons multiplied by one weight matrix, you get your output, then you multiply it by another matrix, you get your thing. And I said, if you can multiply those two things together, you get a big giant weight matrix. You don't have to multiply those things together. You can keep them as the subcomponents. And that yeah. drastically reduces the computation. Um, so um, it still gives the same well, answer, that, but. That's the famous uh, fact that is exploited by tensor product networks. Exactly. 
there are more efficient ways of computing tensor products than exactly than yeah yeah fact yeah so so the weight matrices that we generate are always perfectly factorable so hey cool take advantage of that um we've also used that a lot in uh when applying moon mapping onto this weird hardware if you have like hardware where you're, you've distributed your network across a whole bunch of computers and you have so one neural network that's running on this computer and another neural network running on another computer or another GPU and you need to multiply, you, know, you need to send the data from one to the other. Normally what we'd have to do is you have this giant connection weight matrix and you've got to send all of the data from all the neurons across. Um, but you can also do that same trick. You can multiply one of the factors of your weight matrix and then you get a nice compact piece of information, pass that over that have that compact piece of information being what's passed between the computers and then multiply again on the other side. So that ended up being a huge advantage. We even, um, so the, there was a neuromorphic hardware project called Spinnaker um, from the University of Manchester yeah. in the UK. Um, and they had designed their hardware such that they could say, okay, we can, we can handle about a thousand neurons per chip or per core. And then they had lots and lots and lots of cores. Um, and then we brought in that algorithm and they were like, oh, now we can we we can double what we had expected we could do. So we actually hit two thousand on that. Um, so we we doubled their performance just by having um, connection weights of that form um, and taking advantage of that. So there's a lot of neat math tricks. It does all end up being whatever neuron nonlinearity that is good to implement on your on your hardware. Um, that weight matrix multiplying. Uh, oh, the, and the only other step in there is the low pass filter for the synapse or whatever your synapse model is. Um, but that's also a really easy computation. That's just that's just a multiply. That's a low pass filter. Um, so uh, so it turns out that the core low level steps um, are pretty straightforward. Um, and that's one of the advantages of being forced to sort of say, look, everything is neurons. There's no little, OK, you have a tiny little component in here that's an if statement. <laughs> um, uh, everything is neurons, and so that makes it much more possible to make really custom hardware. I mean, as soon as you can convince uh, one of the big um, software companies that this is the future of deep learning or something, then they'll just <laughs> they'll just get David Patterson to like design a chip to do it. So exactly, we keep having these conversations. But, but, I mean, one so as a as a sort of a serious note. There have been calls for custom hardware to do neural networks for as long as neural networks have been around. I mean, I mean the classic Perceptron hardware. I mean, there's, there's this giant computer from what was that 1956 or something that was for implementing um, image recognition. Like that's like those things have been happening for ages, and it has never panned out. It's never turned out to have been useful. So it's a, it is a hard sell. That said, I think there's an advantage right now because industry has really bought into this idea of, hey, look, we want voice recognition on our cell phones. We want image recognition. We, um, there's there's at least there is, I think, more of a chance of there being a market. Um, and so even particular things like um, doing the voice recognition on a cell phone, because I mean, right now, this approach of taking your voice, sending it off to the cloud, doing the voice recognition on the cloud and sending the results back, not only is that incredibly energy inefficient, but it's also a privacy nightmare. Um, and um, and if you can do a custom chip that'll do that in ridiculously low power on your cell phone, then there's a huge market advantage of that. Um, so that's exactly what the spin-off company, Applied Brain Research, is really trying to push, is, hey, um, can we show a situation where right now you will save lots of money? <laughs> um, and for me, I just want that because then that'll encourage industry to make the big computer that I want in order to do my cognitive science research. I do not care about voice recognition on my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, as a we'll way cut into that it, part out of the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, the, in the same sort of way that GPUs were an incredible boon to research, um, but they were initially designed because gamers wanted fun graphics in their computer games. Right? It's a, I, I want the same sort of thing to happen. Um, uh, for this sort of neural network. Yeah. Are you excited by the prospect of um, things? I mean, I, there's things like um, memristors being able to like natively implement the actual <laughs> dynamics of spiking yeah. neurons. I mean, that would yeah. just be a game changer, right? Yeah, I've I've had so many fun conversations with the memristor people, and it's uh, still trying to figure out 
to be able to do that and have them at scale and have the memory be a, like of the length that you really want is I mean, depending on how you design the memristor, it sort of maybe it, it maintains its information over not quite as long as time as you might want. Um, we haven't yet found a killer app for that. Um, so I really want to want to keep an eye on that sort of thing. Um, but um, right now, I think my the, there's at least this proven technology of I think we could get you know a hundred times power improvement out of the analog hardware. I want to I mean, and that's just manufactured using totally normal chip manufacturing techniques. The design is wildly different because you're doing analog design instead of digital design, but at least the manufacturing process is the same. Whereas with a lot of the memristor stuff, it's how do you manufacture it at scale? It's hard. Yeah, um, it's exciting. Okay, great. I think, unfortunately, we do have to end it on that note. Yep. <laughs> thank you so much, Tully. Um, it was great to have you on screen and thanks for the interaction. Thank you, and sir. then um, let me just make this full screen. There we go. And thank you so much to you, Terry, for this this wonderful talk. It was oh, really, very engaging and very cool. And um, yes, let's please also show some appreciation for Dr. Stewart in the comments um, and just thank him and applaud him there. And thank you to all of you for attending this evening. And then um, if you look to the bottom of your screen, you will see the, the button where you can um, subscribe to our events calendar. So it's a Google calendar that we will keep updated with all of our future events. Um, so if you subscribe there, then it, it should be added to your calendar also. So then you can sort of know when Nerve is happening. Um, and also keep an eye out for our survey following this event. We always appreciate your feedback um, to see how we can continue to improve the Nerve experience for everyone. Then lastly, thank you to our sponsors, Stellenbosch University and the Biomedical Engineering Research Group. And with that, um, yes, I am concluding this event and I hope to see you all again next time for our next event on the 15th of July. Thank you and good night. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. And uh, I will hopefully be able to respond to some of the other things in comments and please email me. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. <laughs>